Um, yeah, so uh, I will talk about just one way to learn Rust. Of course, uh, there are many, many others, and it's not, uh, uh, it, maybe it's not the best one, but still, here's what we have. So we're going to talk about self-learner first. So it's just a person who wants to learn Rust. And uh, we presume that this person knows one other programming language. Uh, and uh, otherwise, it's a little bit different. So I'm not going to talk about Rust as a first programming language. So there are so basic ways to learn a new programming language. Like you can read a book, uh, you can look at examples, especially if you like know some other programming language. Sometimes you don't want to read a long, long text. You just look at examples and get ideas and uh, go with that. And of course, you can solve problems. And usually when we're talking about solving problems, it's a good idea to have some tests just to check if it's all right, if you get it correctly, are there any problems? And in Rust community, we have several resources for doing exactly that. Like we have Rust programming language book, we call it the book, one of the most uh, important books for first time Rust learners. We also have great resource Rust by example, like for several areas of uh, uh, things like command line arguments, iterators, ownership, and examples for all those topics. And we have Rust links. Rust links is a collection of small exercises, not to learn the whole Rust, but just to get your hands wet in Rust features. But in this situation, something is missing. And when I say that, I mean tooling. And we at JetBrains, we are just do tools for things like that. So I want to present one tool from uh, our educational content team, which is called uh, Rustlings Adaptation. So we adopt Rustlings and we made something new uh, of it. So here is an example of a window. It's an IDE uh, where you can see a course structure you can see some code example, and you can see fragment of the Rust uh, programming language book, which describes this example. In fact, what we, we've done, we, we take uh, the book and uh, make it into many, many small pieces. And for every small pieces, we just take one, the most important example in this uh, fragment. And here you can see this code, you can work with it as usually in IDE, you can run it, you can explore errors, you can do whatever you like in, 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 with this window. And then of course, there are problems that you can solve. And for problems, you can write your solution. For example, this is a problem uh, which goes about uh, ownership, which variable own value at which moment, and you just uh, have to do something with that. And then you write some code and then you check it and then you get, uh, is it correct or not? Uh, I think with Rust in most cases, uh, one can find uh, himself or herself with uh, looking at these errors and you can do that because it's IDE, you can look at errors at this moment, of course. Uh, and then uh, with, uh, you can explore something, uh, uh, some output if you did it correctly. So this is just uh, a tool for reading, for looking at examples, and for actually writing programs. And you can do all that stuff in just one window of this ID. So what is this Rustlings things? Rustlings uh, by JetBrains, our adaptation. So we take texts and examples from the book. We also take problems from Rustlings original course. And then you can add usual Rust tool chain. We have, you have, uh, you should take some ID from JetBrains, any of them like PyCharm or whatever, uh, CLI and IntelliJ IDEA. And then you have this IntelliJ Rust plugin. And once you have all that, you need uh, educational platform 
uh, which is which comes as a plugin, and this Rustlings plugin, which is a course developed using this platform. Uh, we've made a new release of this course this August. So it, it, it's not a new course, but we've updated, we've revised it um, very significantly like this week. And it covers 13 chapters out of 20. So not all of that, but just uh, some part of it. Um, we have 210 theory steps, like every theory step, small part of theory and example. 200, uh, and 10 examples like that. Uh, so it's quite a lot, but it, it's all about small chunks. So if you like learning through going small chunks, that's, that's something that you may find useful. And then we also have more than 100 problems. So every step is just some small problem, which was adopted from Rustling. So uh, it's not about writing a big program. So it's not something that could cover uh, all needs of some professor at the university, of course. No, it's just for self-learners to make you acquainted with language features. And then we also have uh, several steps for ID, how to learn ID, how to do things there, like how to do refactoring, rename a variable, extract function, how to uh, set some uh, options, some preferences, how to use it. But mainly it's all about Rust and uh, how to solve problems in Rust and how to use IDE for programming in Rust. So this is quite a large course and we suggest one particular scenario for using it. So you just look at example. And from my experience, I always recommend to look at the example first. There is a chance that you understand everything. And in that case, it's not necessary to understand everything. It's not necessary to read something. You just look at the example and get the idea. And then you go trying to solve exercises. OK, so uh, sometimes you don't need to read anything. But of course, you can because it's all here. Just don't have to go anywhere. So you can read the corresponding book fragment and we try to make it small, really small. So you just, you don't have to read for an hour to get to this, but that's why we have so many steps, of course. Then one extremely important thing, like I was working in uh, higher education for 20 years and they know if you just look at example, if you just read something, it's almost useless. You have to play with the code. You have to edit it. You have to run it. You have to explore errors. Otherwise, it, it will never work. So you have to change something and see how uh, compiler react, how Rust react to what you are trying to do. So it's very important. And then after working with this example theory step, you just go to the next step and it can be anything, it can be another theory example, or it can be task. And if it's task, some, some learners prefer trying to first task, uh, to solve tasks first. They just go, oh, nice task, let me solve it. And then they get into a lot of troubles and in Rust it's very easy to get into trouble. And once they, uh, they're in trouble, they can get back to examples and read text, and whatever. So, so it's okay not to follow the specified path, but if it's example theory step, when well, it's a good idea to explore it. If it's a problem, it's, it's good to solve it too, because otherwise you don't learn anything. Uh, so when I say adaptation, so we've adopted Rustling's exercises, I should say that we are not in one-on-one -on -one correspondence. So when I go through Rustlings, original Rustlings myself, I sometimes see that, uh, well, there can be uh, some problems with uh, uh, problem descriptions. Maybe sometimes they're not very uh, uh, good at checking if it's correct, if the solution is correct or not. So we've tried to make uh, made it a little bit different. 
So uh, we have specific uh, cargo project for each task. And that's why we can learn more. We can, we can teach more with this. We can uh, teach module system. We can teach all this stuff about library crate, binary crate, and we can teach about cargo toml files. So sometimes you're allowed to see tests to check them, to uh, change them somehow. So you can just learn real uh, Rust software development with that. And uh, I have to say that all that we are doing about that is free. Well, not all our IDs are free, but everything for Rustling's course is available for free. It works in our in the free editions of our IDs. So all our plugins, Rust, Edit Tools, and Rustling's work for free. So anyone can use it, no need to pay. So we're not selling that. Well, because uh, JetBrains works in education for many years and we try to deliver everything uh, for free. And of course, uh, if you are a student or a faculty, you can even buy, you can even take professional IDs for free too. So it's also possible. So you just, uh, you can go to this page and then all faculty and students get everything like c -Line and everything else for free. But once again, it's not necessary to buy anything for doing this Rustling's course. So that's it. Thank you very much. And yeah, I, I was a little bit quick here, I think. So here is a link to this course, but it's easy to find uh, anyway, if you write Rustling's and JetBrains. Okay, thank you. And I, it looks like there are some questions here. Yeah, thanks, Vitaly, for the great talk. And uh, we'll, we'll run straight into some questions. I can just narrate them. So Yuri asks, how many people worked on making this tool? I'm asking because probably in the future, the same kind of course could be done for other languages. What do you think? Um, well, uh, this course is special. So we are not doing uh, it from scratch. So it is just parts of Rustling's uh, from original course. It's parts from something from... Uh, uh the book so it was relatively easy like this this course exists for i think four years and uh, i've made this uh i've made alone this major re uh, refactoring for a couple of months so but usually developing a course is just one or two person uh like for several months. So I wouldn't say that it's very difficult. Of course, it, it takes time to, to write tests. We have several sorts, kinds of tests for that, but it's, it, it's not too... So EduTools is a good platform. You can, you can write courses in, in that platform. It's quite easy. There are good documentation, so you don't need many people to, for doing courses. Of course, it's not about doing plugins. But doing courses is relatively easy. Everything is ready for that. All right. Uh, next question is from Bart is, can you or are you contributing back to Rustlings? I think folks would be grateful for that, although it might pose challenges. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so we've added several exercises, new exercises, and we want to add them to Rustlings too. Unfortunately, for uh, it takes a lot of time for Rustling's maintainers to uh, keep keep along with all uh, pull requests. So of course we'll add our exercises there. Surely that's that's important, and we own that. All right, Matthew asks, do you have any user studies that narrow in on why this approach works? Parentheses possibly better than something else. Uh, no, I don't think so. So we uh, we have some experience of uh, other courses for other languages, like for Kotlin, for Python. And I should say that this Rustling adaptation is not very popular. It's, it's less, less popular than Kotlin or uh, Python course, but we are not trying to uh, explore that. So I wouldn't say this is a mainstream uh, direction for our, educational department. So we don't spend resources on researching that. 
Got it. Well, there's another question similar to the user studies from Galileo who asks, how do you integrate feedback into the courses? I could imagine this being a super valuable tool for other contributors to wrestling, given the potential for tight integration of the feedback system into the IDE slash course functionality. Well, uh, yeah, uh, first for, for every task, we have a special button for sending some feedback. So you can you can just write whatever you think about this task. And uh, what is more, this course is uh, published openly on GitHub. So anyone can add a task to it, can just fix something, just send pull requests, and we are looking at that. So we are trying, so everything is open source, so it's, it's quite easy to contribute. All right. And then there was a question from me, which was, uh, I, it's, it's interesting you talked about how it's important that students need to not just read, but interact with examples in order to understand them. And I'm curious, it, part of the challenge I, I guess I see in that is, uh, it seems like an unstructured process. Like, how do I tell a student, go play with this example? And so I'm curious if you've seen, I don't know, certain patterns of interactions, or if there's any kind of methodology you could say helps students more effectively interact with examples so they learn the underlying concepts. Well, uh, from my experience, it's important to show them first, what, what does it mean to play with examples? Like if you're talking about something that, during the lecture, then you can show, well, we have this example. Let's try to do something different. Let's try to add some a variable. Let's try to, I don't know, uh, just remove this and see what's going on. So you, you just show them first and then they know what to do. But, but it's important that they are not working by some uh, predefined steps because predefined steps is different. So they do need to start learning by themselves anyway. So I just, I think it's a good idea to show them examples first, how you do that. And then they quite quickly pick up your idea. That's what I think. Great. Uh, Rose asks a follow-up, which is, I agree with the idea of playing in lecture. Is there a way to replicate that for self-studiers? Uh, yeah, that's that's a hard question. I, I don't know actually. <laughs> maybe it's a good maybe it's a good idea for us to promote this course just to record a video. How should we work uh, through this course and show that? So maybe you thank you, Bart. I'll think about that. Maybe it's a good idea, really. Yeah. So just 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 to show how to work just by some recording some video. Thank you.